This is a composite of images spanning the career of Sir Cecil Beaton, one of the country's most inspiring portrait photographers. In a few minutes, you'll be able to distinguish between the different types of portraits shown here. Beaton began by photographing his family, just as you might do. His sister Barbara is the third picture in from the left on the top row. He was a fashion photographer. He diversified into celebrity work, both of movie stars and royalty. During the Second World War, he worked for the Ministry of Information, both domestically and internationally. The child on the bottom row, three-year-old Eileen Dunaher, is a hospitalised air raid victim from London. The woman on the bottom left was a shipyard welder in the north of England. The soldier on the right was in Egypt. Sir Cecil Beaton took his first portrait of Princess Elizabeth in 1939, and the one on the right at the top was in 1953 when she was crowned. This is Graham Wilson. And this is part three of the bronze course in photography. This week, we explore portraiture. If you believed Microsoft and the entire print industry, you would think that all landscapes were horizontal oblongs and all portraits were vertical ones. There's absolutely no reason to be constrained like this. Robert Mapplethorpe was one of the world's most famous and in his day most controversial portrait photographers. And here's one of his celebrity portraits, David Hockney. It's in landscape format. To be fair, head and shoulders shots, that's where they got the name for them for the shampoo, not the other way around, often are vertically oriented. But there's really no reason why they should all be so. There are many different types of portrait, and even within those, there will be distinct styles according to the photographer. Even two photographers at the same wedding, for example, will take two very different styles of image. We're going to be looking at these four types today. Traditional, candid, environmental and headshot. In this picture, Mark Riley, the operations manager from Matthews Flour Mill, demonstrates one of the stages in the process of modern day milling. This is an example of an environmental portrait. Mark is shown in his work environment and is doing something in what is clearly a posed image. No extra lighting was available at the time, so the shot was made with what is known as available light. It's far from perfect technically, but it achieves its purpose as a record. Compositionally, you'll see the rule of thirds, leading lines and focus on the nearest point. Environmental portraits are always enjoyable to create. People love to show you what they do at work. It's always interesting. And once you've addressed any technical challenges, the photo taking is usually quite straightforward because there's no props or expensive sets to be produced. This is a great style to use with children and friends and relatives because it's much more dynamic and engaging than a grab shot of them just sitting around. Two musicians, part of a band accompanying Morris dance as at a village fete. A pop-up studio is created in a marquee with a black backdrop. That shows the marks less. And one flashlight above and to the left and one reflector below and to the right. People could drop in and have their pictures taken quickly for a contribution to the village community fund. This is a traditional portrait albeit of two less than usual characters. The set is very much controlled, as is the lighting in theory, and the individuals are posing. In fact, the lighting was a challenge. The sunlight on the marquee was intense. Sorry. And although it was nicely diffused, it was so strong that it sometimes prevented the flash from triggering, which meant that some shots had people with shadows underneath their chins. This one worked fine, but you can see that the bright light outside is reflected in the spectacles of the woman on the right. A commercial headshot. This is also a rather minimal environmental portrait showing Jules in her consulting rooms. She's a psychotherapist and needs to convey a relaxed posture while maintaining an intensity of attention to her clients and non-judgmental care yet not so gushing 
that they might feel that they can deceive her. Light is from two sources. Below and left is a portable flash with a large diffuser. Above and right are large windows with a bright sunny day outside. I tried several positions in the room to get the lighting right with enough shadow to give her face depth, but without creating too much. I was keen to blur the background and focused on her eyes, which meant that her hands are a bit blurred. Had I focused on them as the thing closest to the front, then they would have appeared to be massive. Compositionally, you'll see rule of thirds around her right eye and a diagonal line leading from her hands to her face and up to the picture on the wall. You don't need any of the kit to take this kind of shot. You just need to be prepared to move the subject around until you find the right balance of light. But you do need to engage in conversation with them to establish what they're hoping for from the images, how they'll use them and so on portrait. As you'll guess, this was taken before the COVID lockdowns. The venue is a beautiful Victorian water pumping station, now redundant but converted for events. The party was in full swim. swing. Lights were very dim and extremely unpredictable. Notice the big bright blue colour bar to the right and behind the woman's back. There was no way that available light would be sufficient and to take portraits of as many of the guests as possible, there were around 250, I needed to be mobile, wandering around and capturing things as I saw them unfold. A lot of people saw me coming and either turned subtly away or posed, usually with that stiff appearance and a weird grin. OK, so I saw this couple from across the room. They'd only met this evening and they clearly had the hots for one another. I made my way over to them with my camera raised and ready to bring the viewfinder to my eye. Believe me, I was nothing if not obvious. When I was about three or four feet away, I stopped, brought the camera to my eye, focused on her nose, reframed so that they were balanced left and right, and then took the picture with the flash. It's intense light, not as bad as some, but the lighting otherwise was so unpredictable that I needed a bit of power to overwhelm the stray blues and yellows, reds and greens. The couple didn't notice. So I took another before they turned, smiled and then went back to their conversation. Compositionally, rule of thirds, nearest point used to focus. I like using flash and so have a couple of decent flash guns. However, you could achieve exactly the same effect with the tiny smash flash unit built into many cameras. The problem with these is that they are low power, which is fine, but they're directed straight at your subject, so it will flatten them. Remember that point that I made earlier on about the value of the light in composition. The simple trick is to carry a rubber band. I actually keep a handful of um, hair elastics in my bag and a clean paper tissue. With a little trial and error, you can use the tissue secured with the band um, onto the built-in flash to create a simple diffuser. I thought I'd end with a group portrait. So a quick summary. While there are many different types, we've looked at environmental, traditional, headshots and candid portraits. The variables that you need to consider include the uses to which the portrait will be put, the nature of the lighting, and the extent to which you want to pose the subject. Above all, portraiture is about engaging with and being interested in the animals that you're photographing.